see a little bit of that. So that's me. I should be standing under my arrow. Uh, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to squeeze in as much as I can over here. But uh, you know, it's, this is one of those things when you have like 25 years of work, and we have. 40 minutes to show them in. So I'm only going to show a couple of projects and talk a little bit about how the relevance to some of the conversations that are happening today. But ilahi.org or ilahi.umd.edu, that'll uh, kick into my website, and you can take a look at a lot of them. Uh, you know, this morning, Julio, you asked me, like, how did this whole thing begin? And you know, I think I should share this story with many of you. And I think, uh, so I, I never really intended on becoming an artist. It just kind of happened accidentally. Uh, I, I never finished high school. I just kind of left. I never got a GED. So I kind of had like 200, 300 credits or something like that. And nothing to make a degree in. Uh, and I kept switching schools so many times because I would, I would go from like, you know, like architecture to design to geography to child and family studies to marketing to communication. And then eventually it came to one of those situations where it got so embarrassing uh, because my uncle, who was a dean at a small school in Pennsylvania, came to the house with those old school, you know, back when catalogs were printed as books, and he says, you have to get a degree in something. It doesn't matter what. Just, just pick something. And, uh, and I'm flipping through, and I was like, oh, I only need 27 credits to be an art major. And, and I really don't mean this in a flippant way, because that was the easiest way to get a degree. But what had happened is that I actually met some very influential people there, and then went down to grad school in the arts. But it was really using the arts as a platform to study anything to any extent really use that as the, as the springboard to allow different types of research to take place in order to make work. So it's more of a practice based. And, you know, and one of the things that I learned during that process is that I'm really interested in art that barely passes for art. Uh, and I think, I think that's kind of important. And I want to show you a couple of early works from, from some other people. And then uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how that leads into my, my current work. So I want to start off with this piece from Michael Neymark in 1978 called Aspen Movie Map. And Michael had this idea that he was going to attach this film camera, this movie camera, video camera, in 1978 and drive up and down the streets of Aspen filming all of it. And then he'd cross, and then he created this interface where you'd click on different things and you'd stop and it would rewind the videotapes and it would show you what that location was. Now, Michael was also part of the very first uh, the MIT Architecture Group, which is now the Media Lab. But if you think about it, does this look kind of familiar to this? I mean, we don't even think of Google Street View as a work of creative product. And again, a lot of this may not be one-to-one -one direction. And I have to thank my friend Golan Levin at Carnegie Mellon for reminding me of this uh, project. Because it's one of those things where you think of artists who create works, or in this case, this film that barely passes for film, and they introduced it at a point in culture, at a point in time where it's like, what is this? And then it just becomes so normalized that we don't even think of this as anything other than, well, it's Google Street View. I mean, well, of course it's Google Street View. That's what it is. So I find that these types of things really exciting. Similarly, uh, my friend uh, Evan Roth, who was part of Graffiti Research Lab, which is also, the, there's a whole bunch of groups, so Open Frameworks and Fat Lab, the Free Art and Technology Lab. Uh, they created the iWriter. So this is uh, Tempt, who's a graffiti writer uh, in LA, or was. And he came down, he had ALS. And uh, so he was, uh, so he, his body, it's a horrible disease. Actually, my mom has this. This is the first time I'm actually talking about this project since I found out that my mom has ALS. Uh, so that's kind of strange for me seeing this image here. Because I've been, because this is, a, Evan Roth and I have been friends for a long time, but this is kind of internalizing it on a personal level. So what happened with Tempt was that uh, so he was in a hospital bed. And you know, his, his brain is all there, but his body and his phys physical uh, ways. So what they did is they took this like, $9 like, sunglasses from the drugstore, attached these webcams to, to it, and Temp would move his eyes, and he would draw with his eyes. And then the projection of that would be outside the hospital on the building in this graffiti that would be projected onto it. This is a bunch of hackers and artists and activists that kind of got together and just kind of put this together. Well, this same technology is now used by BMW so you don't drive off the road. This is actually pretty amazing that these early, 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 I mean, this is super cool, the fact that, you know, it's like, and here's Temp, like, sitting there, and he's, like, moving his eyes, and he's drawing on this massive building right outside the, right outside the hospital. And uh, so, anyway, so this is another group of artists and... Now it's like, I'm not exactly sure where the, what would be called the art object here. 
I mean, and because sometimes it's actually the process and the journey of it rather than the final end product of it. Let me move forward a little bit. One of my favorite artists is Mel Chin. And I absolutely love Mel's work. And this is one of the earliest, earliest of pieces that I could, well, I mean, he has a long, long, long history and a long career with work. And uh, in 1990, he was invited to come to uh, Minneapolis or St. Paul at, the, at this dump, at this toxic dump site, and uh, to do a project there. And then he figured, well, OK. Uh, and then he, he, he'd been doing some uh, work back and forth. And, and, and it's, it's, uh, the, he found these types of plants. There's hyperaccumulators that are attracted to heavy metals in the soil. And he spoke with some, science, uh, some plant science folks. And, and the idea was that, yeah, this, is, this might work in theory, but this is not practical. This will never happen. So of course, Mel being the artist and not the scientist, decides, what do I got to lose? I'm going to get a whole bunch of people together. They put on their hazmat suits, and they went out, and they planted these sunflowers in the, in the field out there. And sure enough, after they harvested the sunflowers, it sucked up, and they noticed that there were chunks of metal inside the stalks. This same process is now used for environmental remediation throughout the country. And you know, it's, again, Mel being the, the artist who will take these risks, and not, ne not necessarily through a scientific process. So I want to show you another quick project from Mel before we get started, uh, before I start talking about my work. I'm really excited. This is his uh, sort of most recent work, which is called Fundred. So Mel's from Houston and shortly after Katrina, which was just this horrible devastation in New Orleans. And artists, architects, designers, all sorts of people came out to New Orleans to try to rethink and rebuild the city. How do we do this? And I mean, it was just devastation. And Mel went there and said, I can't do anything. I'm, I, this is beyond my scope of understanding. The devastation is so great that I really can't do anything. He went back to the studio. And then it realized, and then he dawned onto him that the problem in New Orleans, actually there was a bigger problem. Uh, I mean, obviously the, the, earth, uh, the, the hurricane was devastating. But what had also happened was that there were, uh, New Orleans had been so much contaminated with lead in the soil that that causes a lot of brain damage, which causes erratic behavior. Which, and there's absolutely a, a direct correlation between the areas that have the highest levels of lead contamination and the correlation of that of incarceration and violent behavior and crime. So, so I think there's something like there's um, the EPA limits in the US. It's something like 400 parts per million. I think in Canada, it's like 80 parts per million. In Norway, it's like four parts per million. It's like the legal limit. You know, it's, as, as Mel says, because we're bigger and badder, we, our, our limit's 400 uh, parts per million. And uh, there, are, there are parts of New Orleans where it's in the, in the several thousands. It's like 5,000 parts per million or 7,000 parts per million. This is just horrible, I mean, horrific situation. So his proposal was, if you're going to rebuild New Orleans, you need to replace all the soil in New Orleans first. And you know, if you have lead damage in your backyard, people can Re, uh, people, you can do, you can solve this by replacing. It's often I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, but often you replace the first top six inches of topsoil, and that will keep the lead under control. So, how do you do that across a city the scale of New Orleans? How do you replace all the soil in New Orleans? So he's talking to some policy folks and some some scientists and some uh, urban planners, and basically it was like, well, it's going to cost a lot of money to do this. Well, how much? Well, it's going to be a lot of money. OK, so eventually they came up with a number that said, well, maybe 300 million, sh 300 million should be about adequate. You know, we can, we can do that. OK. And Mel, being the artist and not necessarily the banker, says, OK, I will bring you $300 million. So th this project, it's a beautiful, beautiful project. So it's called Fundred. So you go to fundred.org, download a template, and you draw a single $100 bill. He's doing this primarily with school kids, but adults can participate as well. But most of the participants so far have been children. And you draw a $100 bill, and you put that together. And then you send it, you send it to a safe house, uh, which is often in schools throughout the, throughout the area. And then he has an armored truck that drives throughout the country picking up these $100 bills. And the plan is, when he has $300 million, to take this pile of money to Congress, to the steps of the Capitol, in Washington and ask for an even exchange. So again, I'm not exactly sure. Is the actual object the, the pile of money? Is the art 
process, the collecting of, the, of, the, uh, of it? Is, it? is it the replacing of the soil? But it's this type of engagement, this type of things where an artist comes in and just kind of just nudges the system a little bit and really gets us to think a little bit differently about, what, uh, about how to I interact with society and, 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 and the social responsibility of an artist. I th I, I, this is one of the reasons that I really love his work. Uh, he has, I think, it's, 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 it's going to be a while before he hits 300 million. I think la I just saw him last week. And I think they're up to about $50 million right now. But still, $50 million in hand-drawn bills, it's pretty impressive. But then think about it, the other, other side of it. So $300 million, it's roughly uh, $300 million or, and $100 each. That's roughly 3 million drawings. And it's 3 million kids primarily. There's something really poetic about getting 1% of the country's children to draw these bills to rethink about how a city should be rebuilt. So I, I, I just think this is a really cool project. Let me move forward a little bit to, and I'll move to my, uh, my work. So my, probably my, my, you know, my most well-known work is this project called Tracking Transients, which I've been working on since, well, shortly, since after this day right here. Actually, right, right, right at that gate when I had a flight that landed in from Amsterdam. I was actually, uh, so the, the thing is that I was, um, I was coming back into the U.S. and I get, you know, you know, you, you know, you go through immigration kind of thing, and you just hand your passport over, and then the guy swipes it through and just stops and doesn't even like look up at me. And then, eventually, he uh, takes a few moments and says, "Follow me, please." Walks me through a rat maze, and I end up in an INS detention facility inside the airport in Detroit, which is really odd because as a U.S. citizen, which I take many U.S. citizens, I mean, you usually don't get taken in by INS. Uh, I mean, that's the, the, you know, the jurisdiction's not exactly the same. So I'm there in this huge room, and then eventually this FBI agent comes up to me and asks me all sorts of questions about where were you, what were you doing, who pays for your trips, all sorts of little, little bits and pieces of details. Actually, there's some really funny questions, because you know, it's like, well, where were you? Well, I just got off that plane that just landed from Amsterdam. He goes, where were you before that? I had a change in planes in, in Lisbon. Where'd you have it, where, where were you before that? You know, I was in, I was in the, I, at a, uh, I went to see an exhibition in Germany, and of course, you know, he wants to hear like, you know, I've been hanging around with these guys with goats and beards and machine guns, and been hanging around in caves. So it was, got, it got really, it got really bizarre. And then, you know, where were you before that? Where were you before that? Where were you before that? And we get to Dakar, which is where I was for an exhibition, and he just looks at me, he goes, "Where's that?" You know, not, you know, I'm, I'm not. You know, of course, you can't get angry at these kinds of situations because I still don't know what's happening, but it has something to do with international terrorism of some kind. But then you would assume that someone in the law enforcement of international terrorism would know what the largest city in West Africa was. And then he goes, and I explain to him, and I, you know, I draw him a map of Africa with my fingertip on, my, on the table and point to the westernmost tip and explain to the significance of Dakar and then the slave trade and all that. You know, going into my whole academic uh, lecture about Dakar. <laughs> And then he's like, are they Muslim there? Like, yeah, about 95% of the population. And then, and then we can go to all these things. Anyway, literally out of nowhere, he goes to me, where were you September 12th? And you know, when most of us are thrown these random dates, it's, kind of like, it's like those TV crime shows, you know, it's like those trial shows. It's like, where were you on this date at this time? I don't remember, but I can look it up for you. So this was way back in the days of those Palm Pilot M505s. Remember those with the grayscale screen and the gray and blue? So I pulled that out. I was like, well, let's look it up. So I paid my storage bill from this time to this time. I met with Judith, who was one of my grad students at that time. 12 to 3, taught my intro class. 3 to 6, you can see that I you know, uh, went to a party at Ryan and Mandy's house at 7.30 on Saturday, the 15th. And you can, you know, so you can see all these little bits. And then we read my calendar for, for several months. We read every little detail. And then he, you know, it's, I mean, he realized that I'm not exactly a terrorist threat. And I think anyone that talks to me for more than a few minutes realizes that you know, I'm, I'm, I'm harmless. But the problem is that the system does not trust itself. This FBI agent that, in, that in, uh, interrogated me in Detroit knew right away that I was completely harmless. Otherwise, why would he let me get on the plane to go back home? But he couldn't say, leave the guy alone. This is a waste of everyone's time. But it has to go through a full cycle. It has to go through an entire sequence, and eventually, you know, this went. So they got sent to, to the Tampa office, which was then I then I went back to Tampa, and then I spent the next six months going in and out of this building over here, which is uh, uh, the federal building in Tampa. It's 500 Zach Street, 
And you know, it's all sorts of questions. And then you know, they'd call me up and say, we want to talk to you. It's like, we can meet you at your house. We can meet at a public place. We can meet wherever. You... I was like, I'll just show up at your office. And then you know, I'd just show up there. And then a few weeks later, they'd call me again. I mean, this went on for six months. Finally ended with nine consecutive polygraphs in one sitting. You, have, you, have, you folks, I mean, I, I, know the, I know you folks are doing something with military stuff, so you probably had, had something to do with, someone here must have had a polygraph somewhere along the way. They're not like the movies. They're not like the way you, you hear it. It's like, you know, you have these wires coming out, and then there's a guy with a voice like Hal behind you, like really just calm and really super monotonous. It's a very sedative experience where you're almost, where you almost fall asleep to it. And I, I really don't know what I said. I mean, I, I have no, cause you, and you could only answer yes or no. You know, they ask you a question, you know, is today Tuesday, or is your name Hassan? Do you belong to any groups that wish to harm the United States? And then it's like, well, I work at a university. I mean, you know, maybe some of my colleagues, I mean, you, you might want to ask them directly or things like that. Anyway, so at the end of, at the end of this, at the very last day, everything was fine. The, the polygraph guy leaves, and then my regular FBI agent comes back in. It's my same agent that, that's been with me. So basically, every time I, I would go to the question, it would be my regular FBI agent and then another person, and then another FBI, and then the same FBI agent and another person. They always do this like good cop, bad cop kind of thing, or I'm not really sure how, I'm not sure how they actually go through the whole process. But in the end, my, the polygraph guy leaves and my regular FBI agent comes back in. He goes, everything's okay. I was like, I know everything's okay. That's what I've been trying to tell you guys for the last six months. Uh, guys, uh, I travel a lot, and all we need is the next guy not to get the next memo, and here we go all over again. How do we, how do we, pre how do we prevent this? You know, can I get a letter saying I'm okay? But there's a little problem with that because you can't be not guilty of something you never did. So you know, you're in this weird like, limbo. And uh, he said, OK, well, uh, here's some phone numbers. If you get into trouble, we'll take care of it. So ever since then, I would call my FBI agent. And I'd tell him where I was going. Not because I had to, but because I chose to. I chose to disclose to him, hey, this is where I'm going. This is my flight numbers. This is the date that I'm flying. And he goes, Got it, no problem, pass this on to the local guys, everything will be okay. A few weeks later, I'd call him again, give him my flight schedule, and then I'd send him like things about like where I was going on vacation. Things like, hey, I'm in Cambodia, the beaches are really nice, food is really good, it's cheap, you should, you should consider vacation here. You know, all sorts of little bits and details, and you and would always write back, thank you, be safe. So you know, I'd like write him like thousands and thousands and thousands of words. I'd tell him like every little detail, and he would always write back, "Thank you, be safe." So it was a bit of a, how do I call it, like an unbalanced relationship. You know, it's like here you think you know you're 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 like really pouring out you're like your heart to them. You know, I'd, I'd tell him everything. You know, it's like you know, it's one of those situations that's kind of like you know, like, you know, it's like no, no, I'm not interested. And then next, you know, they've moved in with you, and you're like, okay, well, I guess I'm used to you having you around now. And I have to kind of like, you know, and then, and then they want to leave all of a sudden? Uh-uh, no, 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 no. We have, we have a relationship here. You can't just walk out that easy. So I've decided that, you know, so, so I, would, I would send my FBI agent everything. And then I started thinking, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why, why is this agent so special? Why is it that only this agent gets to know what I'm doing? So I, at that time, uh, I took my old phone, which was those, Nokia 6600s that are about like three quarters of an inch thick. You remember those? Where you have to hit like a whole bunch of times the letters just to get like one word to be texted out. And you have to hit like you know, those with those T9 keypads. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Like we used to do that. It's like this is it's crazy that we used to actually do that to text. We didn't actually use things. So I created this little thing. This is an early screenshot of it. Actually, I mean, I guess these days it would be called an app. But this was at a time when even the app, word app didn't even exist in the way it does. So uh, let me show you very quickly. And you could just go on my site and you could see the, the details. So you, know, you could see that this is, the, this is where I am right Oh, actually, it has to be just outside of here. But you know, it's kind of in the right place, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's kind of like where the, where the phone locates. These days, it's an iPhone app, really. But back in the old days, I'd have to, like, have to send like, specific signals and specific things. So, yeah, I'd have to say, I'm, at, I'm in Illinois. OK, then I'm in Evanston. Then I'm in, uh, so whatever the last signal, whatever the last ping was, it would actually take it and add to it and add to it. So if, I'd sent, if, I, if I would send a three-letter instruction to it, it would assume that would be an airport code. So it would actually reverse geolocate that three-letter and then find out. Now it just basically just reads it directly off the phone with your GPS. 
Uh, so, you know, you can see that I was on Northwest Flight 48 from Detroit to Amsterdam. And that was my thing to my FBI. Said, Look, I couldn't have possibly been involved in that terrorist attack in Afghanistan because I was on that plane eating that meal at this time at this place. So I'm time stamping my life. And the thing is, you're all doing this too. This sounds, this, just a few years ago, it sounded so crazy. I actually went to a company, I went to a, one of the bigger telecom companies, I had a meeting with them oh, about 2006. And the conversation was, and I told them, I wanted to build this device that would track you at all times and would tell people every little detail of where you were. And they looked at me like, oh no, this is too creepy. We would never do this. Well, you know, we, we, know, how that, we know how that ended up. So what also in a similar way, what sounded like this crazy idea and this, like this artist was doing this, all of a sudden, now we have 1.6 billion people just on Facebook alone. And I know a lot of folks, you know, a lot of you folks looking at this thing goes, I don't get it. This looks like my Instagram feed. Yeah, I mean, we're all doing it in one way or another. And then you could bury it, you could go through all that data. So we're all creating these digital databases and, and we're creating our data bodies. So I think one of the things that happens here, let's back up a little bit. So if a billion and a half people are doing something, is that still, you know, I mean, in a way, I'm kind of completely obsolete. I mean, is it, is it still an art practice? Uh, if it's so normalized. And what gets really interesting is a billion and a half. Okay, let's, let's, do, that. let's do those numbers. What's the population of, of the Earth right now? 7.3? So what's, what's, what's 7.3 divided by 1.6? Roughly, what, five something? Hmm? Yeah, four something, yeah. So basically what that means is one out of every four or five persons in this on the planet is on Facebook. Compare that percentage to the people that have access to electricity, clean water, education, health care. This has become so commonplace that Facebook is now the largest country in the world. I mean, it's, it is the largest country in the world. It's become so commonplace that, you know, it's, you don't really know, it's like, you know, so, there's so many things that have changed in, in, just, in, just five, in just like five or 10 years. I mean, so this is something that we're all generating, we're all creating these things. So all of these photos that you're seeing, these are all photos that I've sent to the FBI, but then there's also a, uh, a, a database that, that I've kept. So I have, I have a parallel database. So how does this work? So, you know, obviously I have an FBI file and the FBI has information about me, but by me taking this information, giving it to you directly, it cuts out the middleman and thus it devalues the currency of the FBI. It really changes. And by doing so now I realize on an individual basis I'm doing this is purely symbolic. But if 300 million or 1.6 billion people start doing this to this level of detail, it would force an entire restructuring of the entire intelligence system. It's no longer about having the information, it's about analyzing that information. It's not about having the data. We, we have the data, we know that. We've, we knew that on Christmas Eve when we had the underwear bomber, we had the information that he was going, his father called the embassy and said, I'm worried about my son. He's about to do this, but yet this team doesn't talk to that team. It's the analysis part that didn't fit in. It's that, it's that human connection. We had the information. So similarly, there's all this data that's going out there but in the same sense, how, does you, how do you make sense of that data? And, and when you're looking at all of this information, you really have to reenact the role of the FBI agent, cross-referencing this database with that database with that database with that database and putting it all together. So let me, let me uh, move forward a little bit and show you a couple of other projects that I've been working on at the same time. So really what I'm talking about is camouflage. I'm telling you everything and nothing simultaneously. And by doing that, I, I, maintain, a relatively, I, I, I maintain a relatively anonymous life. Even though my whole life is open, everything is out there in the public, you know very little about me because my information is blurred in with so much other stuff. Now, when you look at this, you look at a kind of a modernist grid of things. So when you see this, this plate of ham over here, this is really shot in Guernica. These two images are shot in, uh, in North Korea in, in there. There's a couple of other images here. This is a really interesting image, uh, geography quiz. Stripe, uh, flag with three, three horizontal stripes, red, green, red. Any guesses? Red stripe, green stripe, red stripe. It's a country that doesn't exist. But. Actually, no, it's, it's Transnistria, or the Russians call it Prednistrovia. And what it is is that that is the place that 
it, it, it simply, it's no, no country recognizes it. It's a breakaway republic of Moldova. It's between Ukraine and Moldova. It's about 20 miles wide, about 100 miles long. If you need to go buy 20 cases of AK-47s, that's the place to go. Uh, this, so this tiny little, tiny little piece of territory has caused so much destabilization in the rest of the world. So what I did here is I took the, took the, the, the sample from the, from, our, uh, from, the, from the camouflage, from, from the troops. When, and this is an early sample of it. And when you look at the way camouflage works, historically it was so to break the body, the silhouette, so, so the enemy could not distinguish between the field, between the, the landscape and, and the soldier. But now when you look at that pixely, greeny, grayish, well, blocky image, there's no trees like that anywhere. There's no, it's not, it's not meant for humans. It's meant so the enemy cannot, cannot distinguish between the, per, between the soldier and the noise and the night vision goggles. It's, so, so basically, the body and the data body are not distinguishable. That's why we have. That's why it's that color. That's why it's that pixel. That's why it's that noise. So I took that noise and I replaced each of those pixels with these photographs that I photograph, uh, with these images that I photographed in each of these specific locations and putting these together. Um, I'm going to skip this one and go to this one right here. So, of all the people that can relate to being accused, falsely being accused of terrorists, it's the Basques. Anything goes wrong in Spain, it's the Basques. The, the Basques did it. So the Basques have a really interesting project. It's, it's uh, Shabide. It's, it's the company that uh, it's the arts organization that it's it's a government uh, initiative that they administer. And what they do is that they identify a handful of artists, architects, designers, and they drop you in the middle of a of a tech center of a of a of a, of a, of a research uh, uh, company. And I got hooked up with uh, tech, uh, with Asti, which is uh, it's an oceanographic research company, and I, I don't even know how to swim. I don't know anything about oceanography. <laughs> so it's like, what, what are we doing? And uh, so basically, we're sitting around and having lunch, and it was Spain. So you know, we have, we're sitting on the, on the, we're having a couple of bottles of wine there, and we're on the edge of the coast. And we're like, hey, Alberto, if I take this bottle and if I chuck it into the sea, can you tell me where it's going to go? He's like, absolutely. You know, it's this, this most romantic idea of the message in a bottle kind of thing where you don't really know. Or, no, they know exactly where it's going to go because and he's like, yeah, that's how we, we would calculate a shipwreck. If we get the signal from here, we know to look over there because of the way the waves and the, and the winds and everything would move things out. So what we did is we got bo uh, these bottles of, of uh, water, this fresh water from the purest spring, uh, at least the guy that owns a water company says that. He was one of the sponsors of the show. <laughs> so, you know, he gave us these bottles of water and then we emptied it exactly halfway. So, it was ex so the bottles were emptied to the, so it was exactly half fresh water. And then we capped it with this cork uh, from Chakuli, which is a very unique Basque wine from that region. And then we took it to the edge of the earth. I mean, quite literally the edge of the earth. It's basically where you're standing on shore when the earth curves over. It's that point that you can't see. But it's, that, it's, it's 11 kilometers, but edge of the earth sounds so much more poetic. I think it's 11 kilometers. I'm sure someone can figure out the calculation of it exactly. So we went to the edge of the earth and dropped these off. We attached a buoy to it uh, so we can monitor it, and then had the bottles float back to sea, or float back to shore, to exactly the same point that we started from. So this calling and responding, this looping, again, this super, 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 super romantic idea of the message in a bottle, but yet we're tracking everything. And we knew exactly where it was going to go based on the waves and based on the, on the currents and based on the winds. And then we picked them up out of this, out of the cases, and they were placed in these fish tanks. And these fish tanks had the water from directly across the street from the museum. And then the salinity levels of each of the tanks were modified to match 31 other seas throughout the world, even though it's the exact same water. So for example, the Gulf of Finland has a very low salinity uh, level. Though the, there's very little uh, salt in that water. So it has a, uh, so it's something like 17 point some, sub 17 point one would be the level, whereas the Red Sea is a very salty sea. So we would we would take the Cantabrico and we would modify that water to to mimic different seas and different waters. And then it was really interesting because based on the salinity level, the bottles would float at a different angle. So it's taking this incredibly convoluted roundabout way. To, you know, when we think data viz, we think of this high tech and pixels and tech, but yet we're using like bottles and chucking them to the edge of the sea and having them come back. And the angle of the bottle 
really read as each of the oceans. So this was one of the projects. Uh, this was about, uh, well, 11 years ago now. I want to show you this piece. So I've been, I've been you know, for a, uh, doing a lot of things with transit. And sometimes, you know, I mean, I get, I get called as a new media artist and technology artist. But sometimes you just have to hack it out of marble. <laughs> so this was the, this was, so what I did is, you know, you think of the TSA. And then so I started thinking about, well, okay, so what would be a proportionate airport to match the TSA? So it was, this, it was this fictitious airport that I created that spanned from sea to sea. But it was of every current exact, it was from the FAA diagrams and airport diagrams of our current airports. So like, you know, so this is like Boston, which goes into Kennedy, which goes to Newark, comes out to Philadelphia, through Baltimore, through Dulles, and then connects them through Atlanta, and then Orlando, Tampa, Miami, and then you have the West Coast airports, you have them. Uh, so, but, so in theory, uh, you could start at one end of the runway and keep running your plane all the way through. And they're actually in proportion to exact, uh, they're exactly in proportion to each other. So, and this piece was uh, used as the part of the Park Avenue uh, Armory show that Creative Time put together uh, as this, uh, for, it actually was exactly eight years ago during the, during the presidential campaign. And uh, so it was beautiful because when we think of the Park Avenue Armory, you generally think of that huge, vo uh, that, that huge space that's this, like this gigantic space. But in the front of it, there's this part of these buildings, and uh, this was on the second floor. And the third floor, interestingly, had a, there was a homeless shelter upstairs. But below it, there was this room with these gorgeous uh, paintings of the luminaries of New York City history. And then to put this right on it, and then having that, so, 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 so looking at the geography and the politics of it, and also the social space of what happens upstairs and, and downstairs below this. One of the reasons I want to show you the airport images is because of this. So this is every airport that I transited through in 2005 and 2006. And then this piece later on, five years later, led to this, which is there's about 600 videos playing simultaneously. And the videos are important because um, I, got, I got a commission from the San Jose Airport to do a public art project. You have to remember, I've been trying to get the FBI to give me a document saying I'm OK, that I'm, that I'm not shady, that I'm, I'm legit, that I'm OK, I'm not a terrorist. But they won't do that. But in order for me to be paid for this project by the Public Arts Commission, I have to be employed by the airport. And in order to be employed by the airport, I have to go through a Homeland Security Threat Assessment. And the folks that organized, the, the Public Arts Commission knew this. They knew, they knew that this was going to happen. And they said, OK, well, you know, so the woman that handled all the clearances at the airport said, OK, I'm going to send this out separately. We know you're going to be difficult, so we're going to send your paperwork out separately than all the other artists. And then a few weeks later, paperwork comes back. She calls me. She goes, your paperwork looks exactly like everyone else's. There's nothing wrong with it, except the FBI called me this morning, and they want to meet with me about you. So somewhere along the way, there's a shadow something being flagged somewhere that brings this out. So uh, I just want to show you a little bit. So in February of 2009, I got this badge. This, I used to have, I took a little off the side of my hair. This badge lets me climb into the ceiling of the airport with like, I, I can walk around with a sawzall at the airport with this. So it's just amazing just getting this, this, so the whole process of even just getting the clearance itself then becomes a project, it becomes an artwork in itself. Uh, so this was, this was an early project. I want to show you a couple, uh, I know uh, we're running a little behind, but I want to show you a couple of pieces. This is a project that uh, we did, Janet and we worked on together well, many, many, many years ago at Site Santa Fe. So um, I've been working uh, for, and prior to that, for several years, I was working r uh, rather closely with uh, Laszlo Barabashi at the Center for Complex Network Research in Boston. And you know, he's, he's a physicist, and he's interested in predictive behavior. He's interested in network science. He's a, and so you know, and Laszlo says, hey, and, and Laszlo and I are friends. And he says, we would love to study your data. We would love to study what, where you are, because so he has this, uh, he, he has a system where he has data and he has millions of records. And if he has, essentially it's your cell phone records. And if he has your data, he can predict your whereabouts between 80 and 93% accuracy. That on November 3rd, you will, at this time, you will be at this spot. And he'll be between 80 and 93% accurate. So I sent him my data, which I sent him an Excel sheet of everything. Because, you know, I track myself for everything, so we have all the data. And then he sent me back this. This is not a geographical map. This is a probability map. I still have no idea how to read it. <laughs> but he's, and then, you know, there's, like, you can see like 8.0 E minus 4, and then 
0.0033. I mean, there's all these things. And then he basically says that, so while most people fall between 80 and 93, I fall less than, was it 0.4 or 0.04? So basically he was saying that you, know, you might as well just throw a dart on a wall on a map and we would have better luck predicting your whereabouts than this data. So he's, he's convinced that, so, because, so he's seeing, a da in the data he's seeing an outlier. And he's, he's convinced that that's the reason that, that Homeland Security flagged me, that they, they're seeing someone whose pattern just does not fit. And because of that, they were, I think he's given them a little too much credit. But then you could also imagine what it does to personal relationships when someone like, you know, can scientifically prove that you're unpredictable. <laughs> so, I mean, this is what Laszlo did. Actually, uh, Laszlo put, a really, uh, he put out a book a few years ago called Bursts on Network Science. So I'm chapter one of his book, and then I pop up a few times throughout the book here and there. And so, so, you know, so Laszlo and I have been going back and forth on this for a long time, and then this turned to this. So this was the show that we did at Site Santa Fe with Janet, and that probability map was animated and then projected on this huge dome, and this dome was about three feet high and about 12 feet in diameter. And the way it was projected down, the video rotated, so it actually looked like the dome was rotating in the floor in front of you. So again, taking this data, uh, another way of looking at data viz and turning it into, well, sculpture in this other way. Uh, the, the, the monitors in the back, which kind of just looks like the scattering, but the scatter pattern is essentially where all the photographs, this is like a geolocation, so these are all the images shot in Florida. These are all the ones in the, in the Northeast. This is Seattle, Portland, upper Midwest over here, Los Angeles, Texas. So, and this was kind of a remake of Nam Jun Paik's uh, electronic superhighway, where he had the neon of each state and he had video monitors from each of them. So kind of almost looking at it as, like a, as a 21st century remix of that type of work. So let me uh, quickly go through a couple of other projects. So this was another uh, similar project. So you know, uh, you know when you look at waveforms of audio, see some of the things? So this is Dick Cheney saying the word democracy. And then it was, it was broken down and then each of the monitors were then plugged in. Uh, so it was kind of looking at the way the pixelization that the military was using for, for uniforms. And that was coming through. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip a couple of these because uh, these are some of the works I've been doing right now in, between landscape and surveillance. Uh, so couple, uh, just, just for the sake of time, I'm going I'm to skip forward to a couple of things. Uh, this is Hawkeye, by the way. So everything that we're doing, I mean, we know, should we wrap up right about now or should we have a couple more minutes? Okay, cool, cool. You know what? I, I can stop this right now and then we, we, can, we, can, we can continue. Uh, some, I, I can cover some of this in, in the middle of my conversation. But uh, I just want to show you some of the folks that have been coming by to see me on my website. Uh, and then this is kind of a nice little three-letter organization. And they're all out in DC. So, yeah. So, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just coming out there. And, and this, is, well, this is one of the reasons that I moved to Maryland is because, you know, we're kind of in the middle of the belly of the beast with all these folks. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're kind of like family. Anyway, so we should probably take some questions uh, if, if there's some. And then, uh, and then I can try to bring some of the other stuff in as, as we're talking. Cool. So thank you. Thank you very much. And more than happy to